It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the seventh Banu Kuwaiji oration hosted by the KEM Hospital Research Center and the KEM Hospital Pune. May I request Shreen Wadia, General Administrator of the KEM Hospital, to welcome Dr. Farooq Kudwadia and his wife, Fira for the oration. Thank you, Shireen. Distinguished obstetrician and gynecologist, social service, family planning, and population control are synonymous with the late Dr. Banu Koyaji. The Banu Koyaji oration has risen some more today as we have amongst us a distinguished speaker, Dr. Farooq Udwadia, known for his humanist approach to medicine speaking on the topic, medicine, past, present, and future. I'm also happy to welcome his wife, Veera, for today's oration. Dr. Banu Koyaji saw this meeting point between science and humanities in the early 50s when clinical and intervention research were taking a new direction. She too realized and called this the sacred space where healing can take place at its best. Dr. Banu Kohaji believed that science may go a long way in physical healing, but for a healing to be complete, it has to be multidimensional. It's about people and the canvas of life they paint and the canvas that is already painted. Dr. Banu Kohaji herself was a brilliant orator and once, after her Ida Skuda oration, she said, this was the most satisfying way in which one could be remembered, a medium where sciences and humanity connect for the betterment of communities and health. There is no better way to remember Dr. Banu Kuaji than through this oration. Now I will request Dr. Farooq Wadia trustees of both KEM Hospital and the KEM Hospital Research Center to please introduce the oration and our distinguished speaker for the evening. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, can I be heard? Yeah, yeah okay, thank you. Um, I have been given a double job. The first one is to introduce the oration, which normally somebody distinguished like Dr. Marshilkar does, but I'll try and do my best. Uh, Dr. and Mrs. Udwadia, Dr. Kurus Kwaiji and the Kwaiji family, eminent doctors from here and abroad, and distinguished guests. Um, it's my privilege to introduce our chief guest, Dr. Farooq Udwadia, to you. But before this, it would be in order to say a few words about the oration which you've heard about and the personality which it commemorates. Now, many here knew Dr. Banu Kwaji personally. Uh, some have been patients, and I'm sure some have even been brought into the world by her. Uh, she was there for such a long time that I personally have grandfathers who are patients who said that they'd been brought into the world at her hands. <laughs> Uh, for others, however, she may be a name because she's now going back into history, possibly not so well known, so something about her. Now, she and the KM Hospital in Pune are almost synonymous in this city among the people. Story began in 1944. While she was waiting for the results of her MD exam, she started working as an assistant in the Dawakana clinic of her very much elder brother-in-law, Dr. E. H. Koyaji, who was a very famous physician in his day. Uh, she probably had no other thoughts than to become a normal gynecologist and practice. But this was not to be. Life-changing event suddenly struck. One day, uh, the brother-in-law summoned her and said, now I'll say it in Gujarati first for the flavor, Ke 
મારા ફ્રેન્ડ મુડલિયારની હોસ્પિટલ છે કે એમ હોસ્પિટલ ત્યાંના ડૉક્ટર છુટ્ટી પર જાય જ તમે સોમવારે ત્યાં જજો કામ કરવા ઇન અધર વર્ડ્સ ધ કે એમ હેઝ ધ ચીફ મેડિકલ ઓફિસર ઓફ ધ કે એમ હોસ્પિટલ ઇન ધોઝ ડેઝ ગોઈંગ ઓન લીવ સો યુ બેટર ગો એન્ડ વર્ક દેર ફ્રોમ મંડે નાઉ ઇન ધોઝ ડેઝ દેર વોઝ નો ક્વેશ્ચન દેટ યુ કુડ ડિસોબે યોર એલ્ડર્સ સો ઓફ શી વેન્ટ બટ ધી સિક્સ મંથ્સ વિચ શી વોઝ સપોઝ ટુ બી દેર સ્પન આઉટ ઇન ટુ નો લેસ દેન ફિફ્ટી ફાઇવ યર્સ now this span saw the following main achievements the kem was transformed from what was actually a 40 bedded lying in hospital to a 550 bed tertiary care multi specialty teaching hospital which it is now and she saw all that coming into being before she left the scene second thing was the kem hospital research center which is one of the sponsors of this oration it's a related but quite separate entity and a genuine research center unlike many of the ones which are put into being for whitewash and and another most important thing was that sometime in the mid 70s she oversaw the setting up of a rural community health program in the village of Badubudruk about 20 miles from here now this was one of the earliest such ventures undertaken in this state especially by a teaching hospital there are of course many other things but these are the main landmarks which i'd like to mention now as far as she went personally she not only excelled in her chosen clinical field she was a very good obstetrician and a brilliant surgeon even if uh much misused word but that really was but the other thing was that she was a pioneer in what was in those days politically wrongly called family planning and this was way before decades before it entered the public policy domain and this grew over the years into a larger concern with everything to do with women and children um honors many but the two main ones to mention would be the magsaysay award which was given to her for her work in the community and the padma bhushan from the government now before i end uh, how would one sum up all that came in what was actually a physically very diminutive package many of you may not know but she only came up to here i would say charismatic and fearless leader who always led from the front revered teacher institution builder and although she might not herself have thought so a dynamic visionary thank you now i'll go on to my main job of the day uh, to introduce our distinguished speaker Farooq Dr Farooq Odwadia um his CV is really very daunting to crystallize it runs into four pages of great stuff i have therefore identified several themes and i thought i would present the most significant elements from them there will be a fair amount of uh, medical um stuff but there are a lot of doctors in the audience i think they would like to appreciate that he had a brilliant academic career with distinctions and gold medals both at the mbbs and the md level and he appears to have mopped up all the awards and all the medals which were available throughout his career now coming to the core of his clinical and teaching career it was centered on his very long association with the grant medical college and the jj hospital group in bombay where he was consultant physician professor of medicine and noted for his teaching post retirement he is professor emeritus there then from 1964 onwards his center is now the breech candy hospital where he headed one of the earliest and most reputed icus in the city he also goes to the parsi general hospital and is a consultant physician to the governor of bombay um if i 
am allowed to comment at this point. I think it's rather unusual these days for a top doctor to be only at one or two hospitals and concentrate there. Most modern consultants now dilute themselves by going to any number of hospitals. That's beside the point. Now, of the many academic distinctions, uh, one must mention that he got the fellowship of the Royal College of Physicians at Edinburgh at the rather early age of 38, and apparently was the first Indian to be so elected at the time. Now, others have come since then. The FRCP London Fellowship of the American College of Physicians, and a rather unique thing, the Master Fellowship of the International and American College of Chest Physicians. Now, this is rather unique because it has only gone to about a dozen people in the last 60 years. And this is because, as you will hear, of his work on the lungs. Um, other important awards have been Padma Bhushan in 1887, and the Dhanvantri Award and the B.C. Roy National Award, the latter being for an eminent medical teacher. Now, if we come to his various teaching lecturing assignments, among others, we have visiting professors, professorships at the Brompton Hospital in London, which was, is or was the mecca of chest disease in the UK, Mayo Clinic, University of Chicago, and the Postgraduate Medical School in London and Edinburgh, not to mention visiting, lecturing at the NIH in the UK, USA. Now, that's not all because there are other interests and these have been reflected in lectures outside strictly clinical medicine. For example, history of the Persian Empire given in Bombay and notably one entitled Tabiat, which is on the medicine and healing in India in the ages, which I personally heard at the museum in Bombay. It was delivered during the Indo-British Cultural Exchange centered at the museum. 60 papers were centered mainly on his special research interests, which are respiratory medicine, tropical eosinophilia, tetanus, critical care. Uh, several medical books have also been authored by him. I won't go into the titles, but they are on the same subjects which I mentioned above, and one on acute respiratory failure. Uh, notably, However, there are three other books which address the history and cultural aspects of medicine in India and Southeast Asia, so in a much wider field. I think it would be rather presumptuous on my part to comment on his clinical career, but the words of William Osler, who doctors in the audience will know as a great figure in 19th century medicine, cannot but come to mind. He said, a good physician treats the disease, but a great physician treats the patient who has the disease, and I think this fits the bill here. I can say this from personal experience over three decades. But all is not work in medicine. There are other multiple aspects to this versatile personality. I may mention his deep love of music, and in fact he is a competent violinist. The story goes that uh, for those interested in Western music that he has mastered the score of the Beethoven Violin Concerto and played it on a challenge from his son. <laughs> but uh, travel is another aspect of him and the story comes to mind of a visit to a school in China 35 years ago uh, where he was asked to sing an Indian song and he obliged as follows, Mera juta hai Japani, ye patron hai Inglistani, sar pe lal topi Rusi, fir bhi hai dil Hindustani. <laughs> I'll translate it for people who may not know this language. And to end, I hope that I've done adequate justice to a person who is a very fine clinician, a passionate teacher, well known for that, reputed researcher, a pioneer intensivist in this country, especially for ventilation, and a scholar, not only of clinical medicine, but of the history and ethics of medical practice. 
Uh, could I now request Dr. Udwadia to come and deliver the seventh Banu Koyaji oration? Thank you. Members or of the trustees of the KM Hospital and KM Research Center, <clears throat> friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for doing me the honor of requesting me to give this oration in the memory of a great doctor and a great lady. I did come into touch with her off and on, largely related to patients which were common or sometimes patients she would want me to see. But my first encounter with her was interesting. I met her as an undergraduate examinee in obstetrics and gynecology. And uh, she had a co-examiner who has, was as grouchy as grouchy could be. I couldn't remember his name. I just know that he was bald, fat, and scowled all the time. Fortunately, I'm one of those individuals who's not easily intimidated. So the viva went on, and I did quite well, very well. And at the end of the day, she tells me, you know, you've done exceedingly well, she tells me. I think you should take up obstetrics and gynecology. And for a moment, I thought, I must not fail on this answer question. So I said, I'm afraid not, uh, madam. I've decided to take medicine. But why? You should, you've done so well. You're fit for obstetrics and gynecology. I said, why don't you want to take it up? For one thing I said, I've already made my choice. For another, I don't feel like doing the same thing all my life and looking at the same part of the humanity all the life of a female all my life as well. She just burst into laughter. And that was how it ended. Now I'm going to, the subject of my talk as has been told, <clears throat> it's medicine, past, present, and future. And I'm going to open with a couplet of one of my famous or rather favorite poets, T.S. Eliot, when he said, the present is contained in the past and the future, and the future contained in the past. Lovely lines. Lovely lines following it also, but I won't continue with that. Just shows of the past, present and future blend into each other, borrowing literally from each other. <clears throat> I think medicine was born with the awakening of consciousness in primitive man. Perhaps medicine, therefore, is as old as man. The trail of medicine has had many twists and turns, victories and defeats, blazing light and somber darkness. And in over 4,000 years of recorded history, medicine has grown into a force, into an art, into a science, into a profession, that has made a quantum leap into the 21st century. Some of you at least will be surprised to know that the roots of medicine lie in magic. Demons, evil spirits entering through the normal body orifices into the human being, creating havoc translated as a disease, and the ancient shaman, shamans exorcising these demons and curing these people, exorcising them by chanting, by amulets, 
by sometimes beating them mercilessly in the hope of driving these demons and curing the disease. Then came the priest physicians of ancient Sumer and Egypt. And therefore, you now come to a stage for a number of years where these priest physicians combined magic and religion as twins in their art and craft. And then came empiricism. Now what is empiricism? Empiricism is coming to a judgment or determining something on the basis of observation and experience. Many scientists poo-poo the word empiricism, but empiricism is very important. Some of the greatest advances in medicine have resulted from simple observations. And many years after that, surreptitiously, gently coming in on tiptoe was science. Right in the background, right in the shadows, and slowly coming along to embrace medicine almost completely in the present day and age. But you'll be surprised that even today, magic, religion, science, empirism are all mixed together in many parts of the world. You will have magic in many parts of the world, distant, different, forgotten corners of the world, particularly in our country and in the poorer countries of the world. And empiricism, even today, is a very important part of medicine, particularly in emergency medicine. Empirical medicine was we practice what we practice in critical care medicine. Now, it's worth remembering that the panorama of medicine all through is just not a chronological listing of events and discoveries. The romance of medicine lies in the cavalcade of great men and women who have trod its path. It is embedded in the heroes and the impostors the caring and the uncaring, who have shaped its path. It's also worth remembering that many, many years ago, even before Christ was born, a great impetus to medicine was given by philosophy, both in the West and in the East. The Vedas in the East, for example, and the philosophers in Greece, Pythagoras, who had his philosopher's school along the coast of Italy because he was turned out of Greece by an autocrat called Polycritus. So he set up a school on the southern coast of Italy, right at the bottom of Italy. Both asked the same questions. Who is man? How did he come into existence? Where is he going? What is death? What is life? What happens after death? These questions, you know, still remain unanswered. But the study of man started with philosophy. And the study of man included the study of his health and study of what wrong, went wrong when his health turned into disease. But medicine has been, in, been influenced by many other influences. There is no field of endeavor other than medicine, I think, which has been influenced by so many factors. Besides medicine and religion and philosophy, medicine was, of course, obviously influenced by economics, by social factors, by geography, by art and culture, by natural disasters, floods, famines, etc., earthquakes, etc., by war, 
and by the rise and fall of mighty civilizations. But over the last 75 years, particularly over the last 50, 60 years, it has been influenced very much by the natural sciences and also by sciences which directly involve medicine. So it's important not to look at medicine in a rather narrow perspective. You should look at medicine against the tapestry of human civilization. Now it's impossible for me to, to talk about the main discoveries of the past in such a short time. I'm not going to do so. But I want to introduce, just out of homage, to some of my ancestors, only a few of them, a representation of the large number of people in the past who have contributed to medicine. And first of all, I want to introduce you to very dis a very distinguished, distinctive individual. A man who ep epitomized the very core, the very being of medicine. From the mists of antiquity, 2,500 years before the birth of Christ, for the first time in recorded history, recorded history, we have the description of a great, great physician. I don't think the lay people would have heard of him. His name was Imhotep. When translated, it means he who comes in peace. He was the vizier of the then pharaoh. It was the old kingdom at that time of Egypt, I think. It was the seventh or eighth pharaoh at that time. And his name was Zosa. The pharaoh's name was Zosa. He was, Imhotep was his grand vizier and also his first priest. More than that, he was a scribe. He was a philosopher. He was an artist. He was a great architect. It was he who built the Saqqara Pyramid, the first step pyramid, stone pyramid, the oldest stone structure in the world, standing today. And he was a great astronomer of that age. But more than that, he was a great, great physician, kind, compassionate, loved by everyone, treated the pharaoh as well as he would treat the humblest person, looked after the rich and the poor. The people of Egypt loved him. And it is written in the papyrus that when he died, the people of Egypt lined the banks of the Nile and wept as his funeral barge went by. He was later deified by the Egyptian people. I don't want to write, or rather, talk much about hypocrisy, as you all know about him the father of Western medicine. One of the great things that he did, besides his beautiful descriptions of disease, was that he freed medicine from the bigotry of religion, superstition. There was logic to his thinking. And of course, in India, Jaraka and Susrata. You all know him. You all know their names. But let me name some important names in Western medicine now. Just a few, I told you they're representative of a far larger number of people, equally great perhaps, or almost equally great, who contributed to medicine. Edward Jenner, with for his smallpox vaccine. Smallpox used to decimate not only villages, but cities and towns in the Western world and in the Eastern world. And the introduction of vaccination was the first step to its later elimination. Ignaz Semmelweis, a Hungarian, who said, wash your hands before you deliver a baby. And they refused to believe him. He did so, and he brought down the incidence of childbirth fever. He was ostracized by his professor. The poor man went back to Hungary. He wrote a book, nobody read it. 25 years later, they knew how right he was, and they built a statue to his name 20 miles off Budapest. What can be a greater reward 
for a man of medicine? Then to know posthumously that he had been of great use and had saved so many lives. Even today, hand washing is one of the principal preventive features in medicine. Then you have Charcot, not Charcot, sorry, you have Pasteur, Louis Pasteur. He was not a doctor, he was a chemist. Amongst the many things he did, the main thing that he said was the disease was not due to poisonous vapors that you in inhaled, as was used to be believed. It was due to microorganisms. And he made an intuitive observation which still bugs me. He said, without experimental proof, mind you, that each disease is to be caused by one particular organism. And if you could identify that organism, and if you can make a vaccine of that organism, the disease could be prevented. He did that for anthrax, mind you, and for certain other diseases affecting not humans but animals, chicken, for example, and cattle, for example. But it was a monumental thing. It was one of the revolutionary statements, intuitive statements in medicine. You know, way back, a French newspaper decided to have a poll on who was the most famous Frenchman ever. One was astonished to learn that the French did not vote for Charlemagne, who founded France, did not vote for Napoleon, who aggrandized France, but they all voted for Pasteur. Then there was Lister, who revolutionized surgery by introducing asepsis and antisepsis. And how could have surgeons operated had it not been for Morton, who discovered anesthesia? The story of anesthesia was one of the most fascinating stories even a layman could ever read. And I must mention the last one now because there are so many. And that's Fleming, who discovered penicillin. Why do I choose him of so many? Because it is believed by most medical historians that the discovery of penicillin by Fleming was the beginning of modern medicine. After all, it was after penicillin that you had the antibiotic era. And then one discovery followed one after the other after the other, till we come to contemporary medicine. But before doing that, what are the lessons one learns from medicine of the past. I think the first is that there are limits to medicine. Every age felt that it knew more or less as much as there was to know in medicine. Every age was mistaken. Even today, some of the frustrations that the lay people feel towards medicine is because they feel that medicine has not been able to provide what they expected of it, falls short of their expectation. The second thing, which second, second point which I seem to gather from what I've read, is that there is no absolute truth. Truth is always relative. So, so many of the concepts and beliefs of the past, which were taken to be sanctified truths by all of us, or of them at that point in time. In later ages were proved to be wrong, false, rubbish. Therefore, believe me, many of our contemporary provinces, of which so many are so proud, in the years to come might be half-truths, false, or even harmful. And this should teach us humility as doctors. Why do I say that? It should teach us humility in the sense that we should respect a colleague who differs in his or her views from current thinking and current teaching. Then again, one realizes that medicine is a structure with a strong foundation, slowly rising and rising up into the sky. Every brick of that structure has been contributed to by great ancestors. And we would never be 
at the contemporary medicine or practice contemporary medicine as you practice it today without that happening. We are standing on the shoulders of those people. Another group, another point. The history of medicine is a chronicle of change. Very much like the history of the world, very much like the history of civilization. Therefore, 200 years from now, the medicine that will be practiced in this world will be unrecognizable by people, at the, by, by, by us. If we were to look at that, we would not be able to recognize what has happened. But finally, ladies and gentlemen, all the great ancestors of mine and of the doctors sitting here had one thing in common. They had what I call humanism and humanity, which lays, lies at the core of medicine, all of them. What is humanism? What is humanity in relation to medical practice? It is the quality which enables the physician to understand and feel the suffering of a patient, be it pain, be it whatever it be, so that he tries his best to relieve it as best as possible. That is what humanism and humanity means. In a way, it is related to a word called empathy. Not sympathy, but empathy. I think, let me now talk on contemporary medicine. The great, great advance of science has completely changed the face of medicine. Medicine is capable of miracles, which uh, 57, you should say in the middle of the last century would have been impossible, incredible. All of you know about this. I'm not going to describe the great strides that medicine surgery and all fields of medicine surgery, all strides, great strides that medicine has made. But there's a paradox. By and large, there is a strange antagonism against medicine and the medical profession. Why do I say that? Look at the number of litigations. Look at the burning of nursing homes, assault on doctors and nurses. The paradox is double, really, if you ask me. Because in my day and age, when I was at the KEM learning, as a student, as a resident, as a registrar, my teachers were gods. They could do no wrong. And the profession was at its acme in the respect that was given to it. And the reputation of the doctor was second to none. But in spite of the fact that medicine has done so much, has advanced so much, Patients live to a much larger, greater age than ever before. Even in India, the average age is well over 60 now, approaching 70. That's a great thing. Even in spite of that, why should this be so? Why should it be that now the reputation or the standing of the medical profession is not as good as it was, and why should the reputation of the doctor plummet so badly? There must be some fault lines in the profession. And I propose to speak of some of these fault lines. I think that the mechanization of medicine and the hubris of its science and technology has submerged the art of medicine and has almost destroyed its raison d'etre. It seems that medicine has perhaps strayed off the rails. Why has this been so? 
What do you mean it's destroyed is raison d'etre? Because it has lost this humanism, this humanity. The mechanization of medicine has depersonalized medicine. So that the physician now, as I see it, relates more to the machine than to the patient. The machine is the interface between the physician and the patient. And what is even worse, the patient is also made to relate more to the machine than to the patient. Give you an instance, just the other day. Patient comes with a headache, he's had migraine for years. And I say, there's nothing the matter, don't worry, it's just a bad attack of migraine. You described it, you had it for years. No, no, I have a feeling I could be having a tumor, I must have an MRI. I said, I'm not going to prescribe an MRI for you. There's no reason for it, but why not, doctor? I think I could, how do you know I don't have a tumor? It's a difficult thing to answer, I mean, isn't it? I said 99.9 .9 recurring, you don't have a tumor. No, but what about that which is not recurring? He tells me. Oh God, I said, go and have an MRI if you want, but I'm not going to write it out for you. This is what I mean when the patient now relates more to the machine than to the doctor. It's sad, but it's true. And what does all this do? What does all this do? I think it's terrible for the doctor-patient relationship. The bond between the doctor and the patient now stands eroded, sharply eroded. And the bond between the doctor and the patient lies at the very core of clinical medicine. What is this bond? It's a mutually trusting relationship. An unwritten covenant hallowed by time. That's how it called the doctor-patient bond. Well, let me go further. The advances again in medicine has done many other things, specialities. Not just specialities, but super specialities. Not just super specialities, but super duper super specialities. As a wiseacre remarked the other day, a known statement, known before. Ah, you doctors, you know more and more of less and less so that you ultimately know as much as there is to know about next to nothing. <laughs> Thank you. Those answer. Reply. I mean, what else would I say? Thank you. I mean, there nothing against specialities. Of course, you would go to a specialist if you had a retinal tear, if you had a retinal detachment, if you needed dialysis, if you needed separate surgery, if you needed coronary artery surgery. But overemphasis on super specialization affects the holistic aspect of medicine. So, what do you see today? You see, a physician does not minister to a distinctive individual. He ministers to disordered functions of various organ systems. The human being is compartmentalized, the heart, the kidney, the liver, the brain, etc. Nobody sees the human being as a person who houses these organs. One must remember that disease is no specialist. In the early part of the natural history of a disease, the patient comes with very vague symptoms. He comes to you because he's ill, vague symptoms. They do not necessarily belong to the organ which is involved or organs which are involved or systems which are involved. It is extremely important to find out why these symptoms arise what the correct problem is, and it is sometimes extremely difficult to do so. But all the more need for him to have a general investigation from a doctor who practices more or less the whole gamut of medicine. That is how it should be. One other great fault 
crack. I'm not wondering why I'm saying folk. I'm something, somehow I think I'm remembering earthquakes. They have fault lines, I think. Anyway, another fault line. And that is the uh, commercialization of medicine, which is so sad. It is a consumerist society. We must remember that. And doctors are part of that society. They are therefore affected by this consumerist society. I think money is the root of a lot of evil, particularly for those who have never had it before. So they want more and more and more. Medical education is expensive. Some have borrowed money. Parents have borrowed money. They must get it back and buy. Parents sometimes tell the son, you will earn a lot of money. And the student or the son thinks that the purpose of medicine is to earn a lot of money. What can be more unethical than practitioners referring patients to consultant and wanting a cut out of that? Or referring patients from one doctor to another, not, for, not because they are wanting to help the patient, but they help their colleagues. That is not how medicine should be. That's a crying shame. I don't know how to root it out. I think it's going to be extremely difficult to root this out. Then comes the expense of contemporary medicine. Contemporary medicine can cripple a family. The expense can cripple a family. 30 lakhs, 40 lakhs in the first five or six days in a very critical illness. All the earnings of a middle-class family wiped out. And at the end of it, the patient dies. Can you imagine the anger of the relatives concerned? I've paid so much. It's a good hospital. How is this possible, they say? And there arises the litigation. It against the doctor and against the institution. The institution can grapple with this quite easily, but the poor doctor finds it very difficult. Then again, one must remember the cost of an illness is partly inevitable because of the rising cost of times. But to some extent, the doctor can help. But one, fortunately, more often than not, the doctor is steeped in his science and has forgotten the art. He relies more on his machine than on his clinical judgment. The art of history taking is a forgotten art. The art and science of a nice, thorough, complete examination is also a forgotten art. Therefore, he doesn't use his eyes, ears, and hands as he should, and relies on numbers, formulas, equations, charts, etc. He therefore, very often, advises very expensive tests when simple tests would suffice, and expensive treatment, when again, simple treatment would have equally sufficed. Finally, the institutionalization of medicine, the institutionalization of medicine. What do I mean by that? There is a strange competition between hospitals to be one up on the other. If one, imagine there is a three Tesla MRI machine, four such machines in a distance of two and a half kilometers in the city of Mumbai. If you buy a three Tesla, we had a two, so we must upgrade it to a three Tesla. If you have this, why has it they got it? We must have it also. And that breeds unethical practices. The CEO tells the man in charge, this is worth 20 crores and you haven't got any income from this at all. What is the meaning of this? Poor fellow trembles in his shoes. He'll probably throw him out. 
And therefore, patients become fodder to machines. More patients there. Let him be well. Get him in. Let's do this. And believe me, the doctor really fools them, them fuels them, they think, you don't know, it's necessary, it's necessary. But that's how unethical practices also start. Now, you will wonder, why is this so? Why has there been such a fall in the value system in medicine? But ladies and gentlemen, there has been a fall in the value system in all society, not only in India, mind you, also elsewhere. And I ask myself, how difficult or how very difficult or easy would it be to be a sort of an island of virtue when surrounded by filth and corruption. Sooner or later, wouldn't that filth and corruption erode that island? I'm not giving it as an excuse. I'm giving you the pathogenesis as to why this has probably come about. How we should counter this is another story which I shall not go into at this point of time. I also want to tell you, there are many people, eminent people, who have nothing to do with medicine, who have found faults with, the med with medicine and the medical profession. I can think of one whose book I've read again and again. He is a professor of sociology in Mexico, really eminent man. His name is Ivan Illich. He wrote his first book, he called it Medical Nemesis. I used to try and make it compulsory reading for all my registrars, if not residents, at the JJ Hospital. At last, one of them flicked my book and never returned it, and I could never remember who took it and didn't return it. Anyway, thank God, he came out with a second edition, and I wish some of you at least read it. It's called Limits to Myths. He's a very clever man, you know. And you know how he starts his treatise? That modern medicine has probably done more harm to man than good. It really shakes you. If you're a doctor, it really shakes you. And he quotes chapter and verse. He quotes the most reputed peer-reviewed journals. And you look at, I looked up some of these journals and there it was to prove the point. And why does he do so? Why does it happen? He said, modern medicine is responsible for iatrogenesis. What is iatrogenesis? Genesis is to make, Iatros is the physician. Physician made disease. And in association with that, also hospital made disease. And he thinks, there was, he writes, there are three forms of iatrogenesis that modern medicine has inflicted on humankind. The first is clinical iatrogenesis, understandable. Drugs, procedures, surgeries, have done a lot of harm to many people. Of course it has done a lot of harm to many people, but it has also done a lot of good to so many, many other people also. It's true that, therefore, one needs to have a certain amount of circumspection before you prescribe drugs which are dangerous or before you engage in procedures, interventions, which can cause problems. That's the answer to Illich. The other thing he mentioned was that it produces social iatrogenesis, and this is very true, I think. What is meant by social iatrogenesis? By social iatrogenesis, he says, that medicine has so conditioned society at large that it is hopelessly dependent on the medical profession. For the least thing, he will go to the doctor or he will run to the emergency department. 
What has happened? Society is hopelessly dependent, which is bad for society, but of course very good for the medical profession. It should not be, he says. That should not be. And the final point is also very well taken. When he says the third iatrogenesis is cultural iatrogenesis. And this is very interesting. He says modern medicine has taken away the ability of a human being to understand that there is pain and suffering and death. So that he will not accept a person dying till he does the last possible thing to try and keep him alive. People now are beginning to realize that more and more. That is, it is not the business of medicine or the medical profession to prolong suffering, but to ease death when it is near. Mind you, this is easily said and done. Because it's difficult sometimes to draw the line, and I say that from personal experience. Boys have told me, not on one occasion, quite a few occasions, so let him be now, please let him go. And I said, he's young, he's got a wife, go on, don't be stupid, let's go on, let's see what happens. So that those who are expected to die sometimes walk out of the unit. Which makes you feel and wonder, where do I draw the line? You cannot play God in a situation like this. The other way around also. The person you're sure is going to live, dies. So it evens out. So I always tell my boys and girls, never take credit for a recovery of a patient who's been very ill. So that in your heart of hearts, you will not blame yourself for the patient who thought who would live but who died. That's a nice philosophical way of looking at things. I want to now say a few words. Before, before this, I, I thought I'd also like to tell you something about the peculiar different conditions in developing countries. You know, we have a different set of problems when you compare them to the West. I have a feeling that if there was a mortarium on the building of large hospitals and large nursing homes for about three years, and if all money was spent on giving clean water, good food, good living, good hygiene, good education, good nutrition, you would probably reduce the morbidity on mortality to a far more extent than building super hospitals for super specialities. This is my gut feeling. We have infectious diseases, tuberculosis for example. It's a shame that it's one country where outside parts of Africa, the maximum number of TB patients with maximum number of deaths, MDR TB is, is an epidemic. It can spread like fire if it is not taken in hand seriously. Of course, drugs, even the newer drugs, will help to abate it, but they can never go unless the econ economy of the country improves and the features that I just spoke to you about are taken into serious consideration. I must speak a little about the future. The future is here. It's written on the walls for all to see. It is molecular biology. It is genetic medicine. It is biotechnology and advances in the physiology of reproduction. The first three, in particular, mingle together to produce our future. 
I thought I'd just say a few words in genetic medicine. You, you know what a gene is. The gene is a part of the DNA which has been instructed to make a particular protein. Any number of proteins in the body with numberless functions. And there are certain diseases which are genetic, some particular with a dominant descent, some recessive. They're not common. To give you some examples, of particularly the lay people, hemophilia, for example. You all know hemophilia. Down syndrome, you all know Down syndrome, for example. Certain muscular dystrophies, for example. And quite a few others, which I don't want to go at length into. Either the gene has mutated, or the gene has not formed at all, or has been deleted by one of those freaks of nature. So the future medicine would like to correct that gene, replace that gene, or do something or the other which writes its function. It has succeeded to some extent in very few diseases. But the common diseases that afflict mankind today, like hypertension, like coronary artery disease, like strokes, like diabetes, like arthritis, both osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, and many others, many other common ailments. They are influenced by many genes, not just one gene. And there is very often a, an exchange of information between genes. What is more, many of these diseases are also influenced by the environment. So it becomes extremely difficult to eradicate them. Would genetic science eradicate cancer, for example? There's not one cancer, but there are thousands of cancers. That's the first thing to remember. And I think the gene or genes for cancer is stitched into the human genome. I don't think in the foreseeable future we are able to unstick all those genes. Well, if you live to an age as, as old as I am, you would either die of a stroke or a heart attack or cancer or perhaps catch a fulminant infection or perhaps be run over by a bus or be crushed by a truck. Equal chances there also in the city of Bombay and perhaps also in the city of Pune. That's how it is. But the other thing about the gene is that now what is coming into practice is gene-based therapy, which means it has been shown that your response to a disease, your manifestations to a disease, and your response to the treatment given for a disease could well be related to your genetic profile. That's very important. That is the reason, ladies and gentlemen, why one disease does not present in the same manner with different individuals. It's the gene which is responsible for that. And the fact that gene therapy is coming into play very much is greatly important because it means perhaps then in years to come, you might have personalized treatment depending upon your genetic profile. And of course you have now a DNA manufactured vaccines which are pure, which carry no risk, and which can be used as preventives for many diseases. Let me give you some advances in biotechnology which affects all fields of human endeavor, including medicine. Nanotechnology is coming to play. Nanotechnology is the manufacture of machines the size of atoms. If that really transpires, it would be a second industrial revolution. The Japanese are very good at that. They're planning to insert small atom-sized computers into the bloodstream that will monitor your 
system that will detect any problems arising in your system, and they say could also, to some extent, correct those systems. You have, for example, also a smart wristwatch. You talk to it, Japanese again, the watch talks to the internet, gathers what you want, and talks back to you. Good, particularly at the bedside if you're in a quick fix, and you know, what should I do? And you ask them, tell me what to do. And in five seconds or 10 seconds or 15 seconds or 30 seconds, you have the answer. But the most worrying thing is the Japanese, Professor Kaku, I remember his name. For a long time, he's working on smart clothes and smart toilet. What text, what is he marking for? He says that smart clothes and smart toilets will tell you if you're going to get a heart attack. Oh, goodness gracious me. Get up in the morning, look at the poo with a palpitating heart. Have I got a heart attack? Am I getting a heart attack? What a way to start the day. Forget it. So that's to some extent. But what interests me most is artificial intelligence. You've all have read of it. I don't know. I'm talking to the lay people particularly here. Yeah? Do you know how many neurons, which is the basic structure, first unit, of the nervous system there are in the brains. You wouldn't believe it. There are a thousand billion neurons. Can you believe it? And they're all connected. A neuron has a nerve fiber which brings impulses to it. The neuron takes that, understands that, and then transmits what it wants to transmit to an outgoing fiber. Well, the neuron, one neuron, is connected to many, many neurons. Each of those thousand billion neurons is correct, connected to at least a thousand neurons. I'm not a great computer man at all, but this, this, those who have done this work or are engaged in this work said that the computer of the brain computes at 600 bytes 600 million, trillion bytes, not million, 600 trillion bytes per second. I don't understand that, but this is the truth. So they're going to make a computer brain which is like an intelligent brain of a human being. It could be possible. You know how sciences, particularly how computer sciences, and there are well-known scientists, great scientists, who feel that this will soon be possible and in time to come, we'll have a computer brain which is far cleverer than the human brain. But ask yourself this question, as I asked myself. Would a brain such as this have imagination? Would such a brain have intuition? Would it, for example, be able to negate a judgment which is sound. I'll give you a good example, a correct, true example. I attended a convocation at a, of one of my grandchildren, Singapore World College, and there was a, people talking, and a little girl was supposed to talk. She came us and told this story. I was passing by, and there was a man drowning, and he was shouting for help. And I said, let me go on. I went three steps, but I said, how can I do that? But my brain said, but you swim well, but swim well enough to swim in a stormy sea. You've not been taught how to rescue a person. How will you rescue him? But my brain said, no, even though you know that the right thing to do is go away, I will not go away. She jumps into the sea saves the man, at least brings the man to the, to the shore. The man is dead, of course, but she does that. This is against judgment. The computer, if she had carried it, and she would ask the computer, what shall I do, Mr. Computer? The computer said, march on. Take a battalion under siege. I'm giving you classic examples. It's completely surrounded. There is a route of escape. But the brigadier of the brigade says, no, 
I know we can escape, or a good number of us can escape, but I won't do that. We shall fight to the end, we shall die. Would the computer brain have gone against that judgment? Then talking of imagination again, that's very interesting. Look how Einstein discovered his theory of relativity. He said, this is all thinking physics, mind you, all in the brain. He said, if I or a man were to sit on a ray of light that is leaving the earth, away from the earth, what would time be at me as I go further and further away and the man on the earth? What would space be? He asked this question. And another very simple question. If there were a train running across the rails and I'm on the platform, and if the people in the platform immediately passing me by, directly, what would time be with them and what would time be with me? And it was different. Would a computer be able to do that? A brainy computer, would it be able to do that? Would it be able to make forays into unknown territory like quantum physics? When Max Planck said, that if you know what the position of an electron is, you cannot find its velocity. If you can calculate its velocity at a particular time, you cannot say its position. Could, he, could a computer brain do that? That's the question that I ask myself. And finally, could a computer brain have consciousness? The self-awareness that a human being has. There's a great deal of work and nobody knows exactly what consciousness is. But a great physicist who has pondered on this subject a long time, a physicist who is a Nobel Prize winner in physics, now what is his name? I'll get it, I can't remember it just now. In his, uh, was it the Gelding lectures or some lectures given in Cambridge many, many years ago, writes this or says this, which is stuck in my mind, He says that he calls it the unit of consciousness is provided by self-awareness, self-consciousness, self-awareness, not by the workings of the new neural structure of the cerebral hemispheres, not even by the liaison between the two cerebral hemispheres. And what is the center of self-awareness or self-consciousness? He says, I think this is a self-subsistent entity. It is a self-subsistent, I'm quoting it, more or less quoting as well, self-subsistent entity which integrates the multifarious neuronal activity or neuronal mechanisms of the brain so as to give an individual the unit of consciousness from moment to moment. A very beautiful way of looking at it. No one can prove it, of course, and people are still wondering what consciousness is really all about. And I think it's worth talking to you about it. And then a little word about genetic engineering. Now you and me and all of us, as you know, have come through a period of evolution. The whole humankind, being, humankind has been through a period of evolution. It is an evolution to natural selection and genetic drift. That's Darwin's theory, which most people in the world accept. What does natural selection mean? It means, by and large, you select those which are the fittest. They say, in layman's terms, survival of the fittest. But genetic engineering can completely do away with that. These, I was going to say horrid, but not horrid, these genetic engineers, they say we will now decide evolution by intelligent design. We will design the evolution. And how will they design evolution? They say, if, you can, if we can put in 
genetic material which is not human but from outside into the sperm or the ovum, we can change the human race. It took millions of years or thousands of years to change. We can do that in hundreds of years. How? We can give you super intelligence. We have a gene for intelligence. We can give you many genes for intelligence. For your height, for your eyes, for your strength, for your brain. We could put in genes which would make you bear immense heat which you can't bear, you can't have now. Immense cold, you can travel therefore to the planets with ease and colonize the planets. Intelligent design. So instead of evolving in the usual method, through natural selection, genetic drift, of course you were, you, once upon a time we were a Neanderthal man. Look at him now and look at you now, you don't resemble him, but that took more than 70,000 years. Obviously in another 70,000, 70, 100,000 years, Humus, Homo sapiens will not look like you and me, he will have evolved, but it will have been in the process the natural process of natural selection and perhaps genetic drift. But you can change the whole human race. And the scientist says, Homo sapiens has, has his day. His limit has been reached in everything. Now it will be a designed race which will be different from the Homo sapiens, superior to them. So you have supermen. Can you imagine the political and social chaos that could occur if a country like America and China had supermen? What about the countries around? Do you think they would stay quiet? There would be wars between the two supermen to start with, and between the supermen and the underman to be followed. This is how it would be. So this is how it is. And, of course, you know, everyone seems to have forgotten in this race for various advances in science that each scientific advance should be accompanied by ethical principles that safeguard humankind. In fact, even now, the pace of scientific advance is so rapid that the ethics in relation to that have not yet been found. So that is going to be a great problem, indeed. If you ask me, what are all these very, very, very intelligent, clever scientists want? What is their final aim? The final aim is to unravel the secret of nature. The first questions asked by Pythagoras and his philosophers and by the Vedas. What is man? Where is he going? What is death? Why not have man living forever? Why should he die? And if he dies, what happens after death? And this question was asked to one of the great geniuses of the modern age, the man who invented, uh, or discovered, invented, invented, not discovered, invented uh, quantum physics. Planck, Max Planck. He was asked this question, this very question. And he said, without a moment's hesitation, he, he was asked, will you scientists unravel the secrets of nature? And he answers, no, I don't think we will. So the man got up and said, why? Because, he said, man is part of nature. And he cannot unravel a secret of which he himself is a part. Beautifully said. But will this be true? Who knows? In another 500 years, what is going to happen? So I ask, Ko Vadis Medicine. Which road is medicine going to follow? Where is it going to lead us? What is its destination? With science advancing so fast, biotechnology, genetics, genetic engineering, will it be that the human values of kindness will fade and die? 
is it possible that even in the near future, a physician, be he man or woman, will never hold the hand of a dying man and tarry with him a while to ease his passage into another world? Will compassion, empathy, be features of the past not to be seen anymore? I think the future of man and medicine rests with man. If he is bewitched completely by the great advances of science, blinded by its dazzling light, it is war for humankind. But however, if he uses science, channels it, channels it, if I may say so, to the well-being of humankind. Perhaps man and medicine will usher in a brave new world. Else what? Else, and here I must say I quote, it's a lovely quote, man will once again be plunged into a new dark age made even more protracted by the sinister lights of science. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You, you mentioned um, about the trend today, about physicians, uh, everyone wants to be a specialist. And as a result, we lose the ability to see the patient as a whole. Um, do you see any possibility, and what would be the way to change that? Is there any possibility of that reversing? I find it very difficult, because uh, people who view medicine in a holistic sense are fewer by the dozen. We are some of the last of the Mohicans, if I may say so. You know, um, but there is a growing, uh, a growing feeling amongst people at large that this is not what we want. Let me, you know, for example, give you the dreadful example of what can happen, particularly in the critical care unit. Once upon a time, I used to go to other critical care units, say, back till about 10, 15 years ago, at the request of a colleague who says, this person is very, or he's a doctor, therefore please come and see him. And I used to find a frightful situation often. I would find 10 or 12 people looking after the poor man. He had a little headache, came the neurologist. There was anemia, came the hematologist. And there was occult blood in the stool, so the endoscopist said, shall I do endoscopy on his stomach and in his colon? This is how it was. This is what I meant by super specialities. Why they have lost the holistic aspect of medicine, particularly in patients who are critically ill. So what do you find? The fine, obviously. The old adage comes true. Too many cooks spoil the broth. That's exactly what happens. But as I said, people are realizing more than the doctors that they would rather go to a person, you know, who has a broader outlook on medicine than on their speciality. After all, just imagine, a pain in the stomach can come from the spine, can come from the heart, can come from the pleura, can come from the lungs, can come from the ribs. Now if you go with a pain in the stomach to the gastroenterologist, I promise you, he will do an endoscopy on you. You see? A discomfort, palpitation, you know, for some time. And the cardiologists say, well, I can only do, be sure that you don't have a narrowing of the arteries by doing an angiography, or at least do a CT angiography, if not a proper. But if you were to take the patient's history, 
you would realize that there has been a dreadful problem which caused dreadful anxiety. And you know that you don't need to do anything at all. This is how it is. As I told you, the art of history taking, of listening to the patient, of talking to the patient, of feeling the patient, of examining the patient, is completely lost. That's the sad part of the story. I mean, there is nothing against science. I mean, science, as I told you, is vital, it's important. It is, it is what has increased the lifespan of human beings. But there is more to medicine than it's science and technology. Technology cannot take a good history. Neither science nor technology can perform a good physical examination. Nor can technology, for example, suit the anxiety of a seriously ill patient or talk to the patient and tell him what's happening or soothe the relatives of a patient who's that ill. Nor can technology cement the bond between the doctor and the patient. So there is much more to medicine than science. Science is very important, but there is much more to medicine than just its science. It's not just the art of treating, treating, but it's the art of healing. And that requires both art and science. Uh, sir, uh, you propounded in the story of the history of, of care, of health care, in which you talked about experiential medicine, observational medicine, and now the modern scientific medicine systems. What do you feel about the integration of our natural Ayurvedic um, homeopathic and the Chinese kind of medicine into the modern allopathic kind of medicine? Look, frankly, I don't know these branches of medicine. But I never poo-foo or disbelieve something which I do not know. Obviously, there must have been something good in Ayurvedic medicine, you know, for it to have been used by so many people in this country for so many years. But do you know why Ayurvedic medicine, in my opinion, did not keep pace with Western medicine? Do you know why? It was as good as Western medicine till about the 1800s or so, 1700s, late 1700s, 1800s. It did not do well because it lacked the spirit of scientific inquiry. That's the reason. There was no Newton. You follow? There were none of the great f discoverers of the natural sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, etc. It was these that stimulated the study and the science of medicine first. Unfortunately, there was no spirit of scientific inquiry. Therefore, it lagged behind. But there must, be, there must be things in Ayurvedic medicine which are useful. And sometimes when I have an odd ache and pain which doesn't seem to resolve, I see, ring up my dear friend, homeopath, who sends me potions, lotions, I take it for two days and forget it. But I tell him it's done me a world of good. Uh, as there are no further questions, may I request Mr. Farad Forbes, governing council member of the KEM hospital, to please present Dr. Udwadia with a token of our appreciation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I will just request that you bear with me for a quick vote of thanks. I think that at this stage um, in existence where medicine, but not just medicine, governance, and in a large sense, humanity is at crossroads. I think that there is no better person to have delivered this oration today 
than Dr. Udwadia. So thank you, sir. Thank you both for having spent your weekend with us in Pune and for having braved the roads and the rain. Um, I'd like to thank the president and the trustees of the Dastu School for graciously extending us the use of the Mazda Hall. For all the support staff at the Mazda Hall who, despite the miserable weather, made sure that everything proceeded like clockwork. And likewise, the staff at the research center and the hospital who Lila and I have been torturing for the last six months. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Babita at the French window for the eats that some of you were able to sample, not all because of the weather. And last but not the least, thank you all very, very, very much for braving the weather and being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you.